yeah, this is going to be a 12 year ride of um, what happened in Star Citizen's UI tech, HUD, inventory maps and Moby Glass all throughout the last, you know, the whole time they've been developing it because we're now starting to see the final parts of their UI. But oh my gosh, have we struggled? Have we had some problems, some serious problems? I actually, uh, before I forget, I do want to, oof, I don't know if I'll be able to find that. Remind me that we need to touch on the use system. That would be somewhere in the HUD probably when we're doing uh, HUD stuff. I'll just, I'll just kind of plan ahead with that right now. Star Citizen use system or probably just any Star Citizen video from like 2016 before 2016. So yeah, today is a full deep dive into the UI development of Star Citizen, how much of a struggle it's been, but also how it's improved. It has markedly improved over the years. We're still waiting for some things that we really, really need to come back to come back. Um, but the things that they have done so far, I think are finally starting to bear some fruit. I'm just gonna check out this last Inside Star Citizen because I have not seen it yet. Um, I know it's about the new visor and lens system. Big fan of that. Visor and lens is the physicalized UI in the game and I'm looking forward to hearing how they're gonna complicate it and actually make it physicalized, but also see how it's gotten better. What's the difference between the lens and the visor? It's down to whether you're wearing the helmets or not. The visor is essentially your hood projected onto the helmet. So it's shown on the visor in front of your face. When you take the helmet off, you're wearing a contact lens in lower, and that shows your hood as well. Of course. So does that mean we just automatically have a cop contact lens and we're not? I was, I was kind of hoping that it was like you had to get the contact lens to make it work. But it sounds like they're they're essentially just having an in lore excuse for us having a HUD even when we take our helmet off. Of course, in a video game, you're going to need all that HUD information. You get information about your active status, your weapons, what you're holding. The um, man, the mission objectives. Your weapon. Ah, it's so much better the the top right of the screen there. Weapons what you're holding, notifications. And maybe the missions, lack thereof. Your comms, your chatting, everything like that is part of the visor and lens. But we don't want to do it and just, it's magically there, right? You get the lens, it's right there. You have all the information projected on your eye immediately. And the second you put a helmet on, you will get the visor experience. It's making the UI diegetic. So does it actually? The big upgrade in 323 isn't so much new information, but it's a new dynamic system for showing. Uh, and wait, is that the so switch between? Yeah, okay, so the helmet equip key bind is down there. Basically, this is the lens system, which you are missing some info. There's no compass, there's no, um, pitch meter there's no maps so much new information but it's a new dynamic and it looks like they just equipped the helmet now you got a radar you got your pitch you got your compass and the, i think oh it's it added like the the things you're holding okay so there is still a difference when they said that i thought that they were trying to say that there was complete parity between the lens and the visor 323 isn't so much new information but it's a new dynamic system for showing and hiding widgets based on your current situation. So all the basic information that you would see, like you need to know your health status. So you have all of these widgets telling you, okay, you're dying from this thing. You're, you have no <laughs> oxygen. Ah, uh, it's wait, you're dying. So this is, this is like the exact view I'm going to have a lot of the time after this new HUD comes in. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm getting from this. From this thing, you're. You have no oxygen. That's me, yeah. It's warning you of all the different hazards that you can meet out there. We've got regions all over the lens and we can specify which widgets we show in them. For example, down the bottom right, we've got the weapons. We've got the control hints. And we- I like the- uh... Specify which widgets we show in them. For I, I like that it doesn't always show you the weapon. Example, so it kind of flashes which weapon you have equipped and right, then puts it away. The weapons. We've got the control hints. 
and we've got low priority notifications, which can take up a lot of real estate. If something else shows on screen that would overlap one of those, it'll... Low priority notifications. Honestly, I wouldn't mind just having that be like a little light that blinks, right? Just give me the, the blinking light. If it's red, then I know it's urgent. If it's blue, then I can come check it later. I don't even need the text on my screen, thanks. Let alone making it all double vision. Come on. Previously, all notifications were shown in the center of the screen, which could get a bit busy. We've now introduced the concept of low priority notifications, which anything that's not super important to you will show in a box down that was a lot the bottom of bullets. right of the screen instead of... That was, a, that was a ton of bullets that he just shot him with. Good armor. Being loud and in your face. Mini, 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 mini map. I'm really hoping that they, we get a map. UI uh, or a map update ISC soon because there's so many questions about this. To incorporate the new minimap. Another aspect of our dynamic widget system is that we can turn off specific widgets when depending on what you're looking at. So if you've got your Mobi Glass open, it can hide a lot of the widgets. So this is finally the Mobi Glass, yeah? This is the first time we're getting to see the actual Star Citizen Mobi Glass. I think maybe they showed us a picture. Um, we're going to. We're going to go through all this, the history of, of this coming together, because this actually looks a lot like the really old Moby Glass. Uh, I like this, though. Uh, I, I like it. I liked the, uh, the Squadron 42 one more that they showed us, which, again, we'll, we'll look at it later. But this looks good. In 323, the only specialized visor is going to be the combat visor that comes with the dynamic <laughs> Wait, crosshair. wait, no, no, get the heck out of here. I'm sorry. Only specialized Look what's popping up in the middle of this guy's firefight. It's going to be the combat visor. Why is the commodity... <laughs> get that crap out of here. I'm not a trader, okay? I'm, I'm trading bullets for lives. I don't need to know about commodity price alerts. Visor that comes with the dynamic crosshair. But you can expect us to continue iterating on these visors in future patches. Yeah, the bounty hunter visor, I bet's going to be really cool. Oh. So the loot screen builds on a lot of work that we've done in the personal inventory over the past few years. It's a new UI giving the player the possibility to just pick up. The, um, I think the added sound effect goes a long way. You know, they're not even highlighting it here, but that little click of scrolling over um, an item definitely helps make the UI feel more satisfying it's, to use. It's a new UI giving the player the possibility to just pick up stuff on the go. The existing personal in Oh god, we have a looting animation? The possibility to just look in the background. Pick up stuff on the go. The existing personal inventory can be a bit cumbersome Since when trying to pick up ammo in a firefighter and things like that, so the new loot screen aims to address those issues. Now when the player goes over to a body or a box, it, it can quickly press F, and this will bring up the new loot screen. This menu is a simplified version of the player's loadout and the entity they are looting. You'll see the looted entity items on the top and the players on the bottom. You can... Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I guess that was always implied with a looting screen. But the whole idea of, of items being physicalized on player bodies, part of that at least, was that you're literally picking stuff up off the bodies. I hope they confirm here that you can still look at and pick up an item. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't look like that, does it? Easily swap between both and equip things from what you're looting by just clicking or yeah and this shouldn't even be called the loot screen this is just an inventory screen at this point i mean you got almost everything here you need to just replace the inventory by clicking and dragging. just not to display the display of the player is a more simplified version of the inventory is to make the experience for the player to be quicker are we that's that's what i'm curious of are we still going to have that inventory screen it it becomes a lot less necessary when you've got your cargo Dick kiosk you got your item banks you got this looting screen how many places are we going to need an inventory now besides the need to see your player as you equip them it's interesting we also now have a separate section for armor which wasn't a consideration for squadron 42 you'll just click a button and it'll take you to a new page and you can swap your armor with who you're looting and see everything that they had equipped player hovers a specific item, this will appear 
uh, tooltip that will tell you the available actions. And that will include, for example, a single click to equip, a shift left, left click to store it. We've also added See, these are the kind of quality of life things that are included in these big features that we would miss when they do their tier zero or tier one, even when they were doing like a tier one version of something. When we got that inventory system, we didn't even have shift click, right? Because it just didn't have time to get in. But now when they deliver us this kind of stuff, because it's coming from a more development, closed development standpoint, I guess, with Squadron, these things actually have features in them that make the feature go that much further. That's a really nice addition. Button to the loot screen to swap between that and the existing personal inventory view. The inventory will stay, it's not going anywhere, uh, and it's more for your management. So what you're okay. seeing here is still, uh, the visuals are still for Squadron. We are planning to do a PU version and that will come for this release. Wait, what? Seeing here is still, uh, the visuals are still for Squadron. We are planning to do a PU version and that will come huh. for this release. Okay. Wonder what the PU version is meant to look like. And our team's last big addition to 323 is an updated shopping experience. So today when you're looking to buy an item, you look at that item and you see a flat piece of UI on the left hand side of the screen. You then need to interact with this item and if the price is high enough, it will take you to a confirmation screen in the Mobi Glass that shows you more information where you can confirm if you want to proceed with the transaction. With the new Mobi Glass being introduced, we took this as an opportunity to remove the old confirmation screen and update some of the UI around the shopping experience. That's good because it's terrible. We really wanted to sell the idea of the AR lens actually putting things out in the world. You will see the overlay around the item. Wait, did you just buy something? Putting things. Oh my we god. We really wanted to sell the idea of the AR lens actually putting things. Hold on. Oh man, buying stuff in this game just got way easier. <laughs> I didn't even notice you was buying something because this game always has to like take you to another screen or something. I hate shopping in this game. This looks much better. That's the, the newest look at AI or AI UI. That's where they are and how they got there. Um, or not how they got there, actually. Now we're going to look at how they got there. We're going to go all the way back to the very beginning of UI. November 27th of 2013. We're starting from here. We're going through the timeline, looking at all the different ways that they have constructed, destructed, and changed the UI to make it a little bit better for the game. Here is the first look at what the Star Citizen HUD is going to be like. I'm going to let the intro happen, and then we're going to jump into the middle and look at more of the stuff. Oh, that music. Hey, definitely some space music themes. Hey, everybody. I'm here with Johnny Likens, our UI designer. Johnny, would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? I'm John Likens. I'm a UI designer. All right. Before, before we can start, hold on. I'm going to give you one look at the UI, and you're going to tell me where you think this guy worked before he came to Star Citizen. Nobody who already knows can say it. You cannot say it if you already know. A few days, and that's kind of brought us to where we're at. But there's also been a lot that's kind of gone in, into it just to get to this point. For example, if you see this reticle, it's an actual 3D object. And so taking that vector design that you saw. All right. Where do you think he came from before joining the Star Citizen team? I know you, I know you can do it. Anjala soon got it. Iron Man. This guy came from the Iron Man UI and kind of started to put that vibe into the into the HUD at first. And that's where a lot of Star Citizen's HUD was going in the early years. So my background is in film and television. And uh, I got a call from Travis, who uh, was referred to me from my work on Iron Man 3, where I did a, a bunch of the HUD design and, and UI work in that film. And uh, which looks great for a film. At that point, he explained to me what Star Citizen is all about. and and how the work that I was doing in, in the film world, you know, could directly be applied to Man, what's happening. Can this happening not get any louder? World. So you work with Zane and a bunch of the other guys in the office. What is the work? Zane was there from the beginning. Some may know him as Muscle Guy on the stage at Citizen Con. Law that you work on for the HUD. Muscle and bone. So listen to what Zane has to say. So what Johnny's focus is in this whole workflow is to come up with a high level visual concept of the HUD, which includes uh, the animation of the boot up sequence and also um, 
sort of like the damage states and how that sort of animates. And what my focus is in this workflow a lot there. is to take that and then animate it so that it gets translated into an in-game asset, which I can then hand over to Brandon. Zane hands that flash file off to me, and I plug it into the engine and make sure that the uh, C++ code is interfacing with it properly. So the cool thing about how we're... It was very plug and try back then. Um, and believe it or not, it was all being done on Flash. They didn't get off of the Flash system until around when we're looking at this video here. We're making a big jump forward here in terms of the tech. Um, we are coming up to almost present day, actually. This is just 2021. So there are a couple good talks with the UI folks littered throughout the history of the game. And I think I've got another one here somewhere. But this one was from 2021. And I pulled it up because it has a really good explanation of kind of what the heck they're even doing and uh, why the UI went from what we just saw and what we will be seeing as we go through um, the rest of today towards what we saw at the beginning of this show, which was like the UI that we're just now getting. Okay. before we start introducing. This is what introduces that whole system. And this one is, or this is the 2019 one. That makes more sense. Customizable elements, if we ever do. Well, yeah. with, I mean, the thing with building blocks and well, building blocks, so basically building blocks is what are, is like our internal term for the UI tech. So the, the tool that we use to uh, develop UIs. Now, I swear if anybody is watching this afterwards, please do not. I, I, I made a video about this system one time calling it building blocks and somebody actually commented saying eight years and they're only just getting the building blocks in. And I was like, well, yeah, but that's, that's not what this is. This isn't, we're not talking about actual building blocks here. <laughs> it's a funny name for a system though. It's a new, the new one, not the old one. Um, so like a lot of it is um, allowing for like flexible layouts or um, being able to easily reflow elements so mm -hmm. they can rearrange themselves very easily uh, relative to each other. Um, and it opens up so much more because we can make the UI so much more dynamic and responsive and flexible, whereas before it's just kind of, you know, if we were to think about like maybe layout customization or, you know, if we had like a, uh, like a grid system, something you can kind of plug into and rearrange on then it makes it so much easier than before because everything before was just hardwired. It was very static in nature. Mm. Um, but, you know, if we have a fully data-driven and flexible system, um, you know, it kind of opens that up. Now that we can, we can start asking, like, what makes sense uh, for customization? Like, previously, it was just like, yeah, we could, we could do colors, but, like, it'd be very complicated to do, you know, like, um, resizing and things like that when you have static, a lot, you know, very, a very statically authored, Mm -hmm. um, UI. So, so that was their big problem with UI is that they were working on flash scale form, the system that did not scale correctly. It didn't do the things that they needed it to do. Um, and oh man, there's some really good questions in here. And, uh, it ended up with us having systems like this imagery management uh, at its core Jesus. is player experience. We focus a lot on the usability. Look at this inventory system. Game development is definitely an iterative process. There's no one who writes a design doc and then a few weeks later produces a, a finished feature or game and says, Look at that. That's not even the worst we had either. It, it, oh crap. I don't have the really old one. It's got to be in here somewhere. We'll come across it. There, there are some examples of painful UI in here. Uh, and a lot of that comes from the fact that they were just restrained by the system they were using. But let's go back to this talk real quick because this is there's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, there are a couple interesting questions I think people would want to hear the answers to. So before we jump really deep into building blocks, let's listen to night vision explanations back from 2021. Uh, night vision. A night vision is a is is a big one. Obviously in space, it's always some version of night, I suppose. But you know, as planets become a bigger uh, feature of Star Citizen, as more gameplay moves down to them, uh, the ability to see where you're going and not crash into a mountain becomes super important. We recently uh, uh, revamped Ping and gave it this brand new shader that this is really cool and kind of draws everything like this. Um, have there been any discussions 
uh, in, in, any, in any thoughts about implementing some version of night vision beyond just forcing people to put the ping on auto fire and just constantly? Oh, I don't know, to be honest. I mean, to see where they're going. It's We've been asking this question for years. It's something idea. that we need to improve in some way, but uh, there's not been not really been any discussions on the UI side for, for what we can change there. I think it's probably it's probably more the kind of thing that the vehicle team and the active feature team would look into, to be honest, because they once you can let people see in the dark, it's obviously got a load of gameplay implications. Like you know, people can not hide anymore or. Maybe we need to put ranges on things and that kind of thing. So there's, there's loads of gameplay implications. To so we're not getting an answer. So. Uh, let's go back to the map. Because this is a interesting first tidbit about what the map was supposed to look like. And then we'll look at what the map was supposed to look like because it's funny. Markers and also the interior map. We think really that should be one thing. So, oh, let me go back. It's, it's a good it's question. I'll tell you what, uh, like we, we knew. So here uh, was, I think, starting this was, with the. This is one of the most congruent explanations of the overall map system we ever got prior to them actually starting to show it to us in 2022. The number one question, the, uh, like we, we knew it this, the second I said, hey, you wanna be on the show? And he said, yeah. And I said, I'll tell you what the number one question is gonna be. And we were right. Uh, any updates whatsoever that you can give us on the updated in-game star map? Okay, so <laughs> it's progressing. Um, it's, it's a really big system. So what we want to do with it and what we've designed in the background, which we're not showing anybody yet, um, is this really big system that kind of combines the radar, the star map, um, potentially some of the AR markers, and also the interior map. We think really that should be one thing, essentially. So uh, like Chris Roberts has always had this idea that he wants to be able to start from the radar and zoom out from that, and you can see the star map, and you can zoom out and see the you know, the galactic view, essentially. So we've, we've been writing around that idea um, so we've got this really massive design that ties all those all those systems together, um, which is pretty cool. Um, we started writing code systems to support that. So we've we've got. I mean, one thing that's tricky with it, there's all this data from all over the game. So we've got we've got the planets and stuff. We've got the radar data. We've got I don't know, even things like missiles. We've got to somehow tie that together in a way that we can put into one place. So we spent quite a lot of time working on the the, the tracking system for all that stuff. So that's all. It's all, it's all good now, and and we're kind of at the stage where we we want to start building the building the real thing. So uh, I mean, the the challenge is spending the time to to fit all that stuff together. So that's that's something that we, we and uh, we're getting it now. About two and a half years later. Yeah, it took him. It took him about three years, I think, it was when we started to really hear about the system in earnest going on. But there was a lot going on before the star map got started. Um, as you heard, building blocks was really a big part of improving the overall UI. It, then uh, I think he said converting it to 3D. Where was that? Oh, that he had mentioned that. Um, part of what he had done a lot that year was converting it over to 3D. So that's why we started to see the, the star map come in at that point. But you can go back to times like this. Let's see, this is winter 2020, spring 2020. Yeah, so all the way back to times like this when they're talking about the act of updating a lot of these systems using building blocks. And this just mentioned everywhere. So at the moment, um, this has basically just been all built in building blocks. So this has all been done by designers and coders currently with a, a, a little bit of support from UI as well. So it's, a, it's due a full UI art pass to properly unify it with the full stasis and uh, menus uh, that we've got in game at the moment. So like, You know what? This is a good chance to look at how does that look different from what they're shipping now? First, is it first person? No, it was uh, it was the interaction system. Let's see how that. It's always going to show stall. Or it compares. If uh, it's much easier to use, and that option, uh, that, that problem I mentioned, where if you're trying to interact with what's in your hand, that's gone. Now the new system just opens the wheel, and you select what you want to do with what's in your hand. It, just it definitely, it's it. It looks more. I mean, this is unfinished for sure. Um. It certainly looks higher quality. It's still not the best in terms of visibility, though, what they're showing us for this right now. But you can see this is where these systems all started way back then. 
well, way back, like four years ago. Um, and it's mostly the 2D building block stuff they were doing at that time. Like the, the new pit wheel that we've got and everything. Um, so we're still due that at the moment. Um, we'd also like to change these to actually have hollow, full 3D hollow previews of each item in here, uh, which sadly we couldn't get done in time for 3.9. 3.9 to fully unify the customized mode with the inspect mode. All right. And then uh, jumping a little bit forward, they really get into detail about how this is how this is allowing them to start using it to make inventory changes. This is before we had an inventory, but they were finally talking about it. And at the time, you know, no inventory in the game. We were like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> everything's changing. First up is a new generalized layout and drag and drop system for building blocks intended to be the basis for potential improvements to the inventory management system. The idea here is that each area can be marked as a drop target, synchronized with external storage, space in your backpack, additional spaces on the chest, and- uh, For anybody who's watching this, I'm not, this is not revolutionary. Almost any game with an inventory does this. This is just looking at the process of how they went through it in Star Citizen. We don't get to see how other games come up with their inventory. There is a very good chance that they all kind of go through this iterative process. There's probably a pretty high chance that that's the case. So I think it's just interesting to contextualize it all and put it next to each other like this. Will any of the HUD stuff be customizable by the players? I'm betting so, yeah. Because you can turn the crosshair off. So I'm sure they'll let you turn other things off. Or legs and the like and that when an item represented here in a variety of box sizes and shapes is moved from one area to the next, they are either displayed on the character in the correct area or hidden within the backpack if placed there. But don't get too caught up in the numbers or items you see here. As usual, any numbers you see here are placeholders designed only to prove out a concept or technology, but it's an exciting next step in the further iteration of inventory management for players in the Persistent Universe. We've previously highlighted work by the VFX team. All right. So that was a pretty good building blocks update, in my opinion. Um, there's an even better one out there somewhere. Not sure if I'll be able to find it. Let's see. Check this out. This is a very, this is actually before what we just watched. I think this was their formal introduction of building blocks through Inside Star Citizen. It's a very exciting time right now for the UI. For the past several months, we've been working on some new tech that we're calling building blocks internally, but really what it is, it's a replacement for our current UI tool. This was literally before we, elevator panels didn't look like this. They were just a list of text, kind of like what you get when you zoom in on a player that's dead right now, and it was terrible to use. So this was a kind of, these were really good things to see. You'll also see an early version of what eventually becomes the interaction system we're now using. Um, even in Squadron 42. Tools. Before, what we had was a very difficult to use system that uses flash and scale form. And what we wanted to do for the developers internally was to basically make a tool uh, and a system to make it much easier to actually get UIs into the game. Historically, it's been very difficult to actually author something, and the process has been very convoluted in terms of you know, authoring an asset, not seeing it live update in the game, having to export, reload the editor every time you want to make a change. So now with the new tech, we have so many new features that we can employ, like fluid layout, being able to flexibly size a layout to a particular screen dimension so as to make it much easier for us to maintain because we have a lot of different screen aspect ratios and screen dimensions that we need to uh, manage in the game. We have some really cool stuff in our U uh, that we built for the UI tech, like um, a way to dynamically lay out elements um, in any configuration that a designer might want. So you can lay stuff out in columns, you can lay out stuff in rows, you can have them automatically shrink or automatically grow. So it's, it's a very flexible tool. We also have like uh, some very unique functionality to our UI tech, one of which includes a post transform, which basically takes a rectangular element and, and transforms it radially. So you can actually easily create radial menus and the, all the functionality that you would have in a regular uh, linear uh, rectangular element is then just, it's simply inherited into the radial menu. That's what we focus on is, is just, how do we make it easy and, and very intuitive for a designer to actually uh, create what they want and get what they want out of the out of the tool. What excites me the most about actually working on this is that is it's very much the foundational uh, system that everyone's going to use to build the UI. 
As the UI artists, we still have a responsibility to define like, the styles and the looks and, and, and the standardization of the UI, but to actually prototype something and prototype some gameplay loops. Anyone can do that now. They don't have to be a specialist. They don't have to have a special program to be able to actually author a UI or implement a UI in the game. They can just go into our, our own internal tool, uh, create it themselves, and easily hook up variables from the game to the UI and test stuff we can actually see much more gameplay start to uh, come alive and the universe starting to feel alive and dynamic. So what did we learn this week? So that's why we did get UIs that started to look a little bit different after that period that were kind of related to like the scanning and ping he mentioned. The mining UI took some steps up. Um, as we're going to look over here with these different updates, we'll see places where uh, a lot of the stuff took steps up over those those like really pivotal years of like 2020 to 2022 ish 2023 and yeah it all kind of started back there that video that we just watched all right here's another update on building blocks not actually sure what this one is and it's one of the last remaining systems still unconverted to building blocks until now now let's take a look at a still very nascent work so this is this was wrapping up building blocks. We kind of jumped ahead here, 2022. Converting this system and ensuring a few quality of life fixes players have asked for get integrated along the way. As part of the upcoming cargo refactor, this was the perfect time to go back and update the old commodity kiosk UI. The commodity kiosk for the rework is tell the player what's going on above all else so that they can make their informed decisions and plan for the future. The commodity kiosk is the method that players use when they are trying to load cargo onto their ship so that they can trade between locations, etc. Um, it is a kiosk that is often situated in either um, a trade and development district or in the admin office of a space station or outpost server or something like that. We like that the current commodity kiosk is stable. Other than that, honestly, the layout of it does a lot to actually harm our gameplay. It does not show commodities on it when they are out of stock or when they are full stock or when the player doesn't have it in their ship. Essentially, a lot of times players will say, you have removed X from this shop or X shop is not working. When in reality, it's just that someone on another server has recently interacted with that shop and as a result, it's looking like it basically has nothing in it. The biggest thing that we're gonna be changing is that if an item is at full and you are trying to sell to the shop, it will still show as in the inventory. If an item is empty, as in someone has purchased all of it, we will just show it on there as being empty. You will be able to go to a shop and know exactly what it is going to normally buy and sell, in order to plan your trade routes and such, even if currently the shop is not in a state where it can trade in that commodity. We're okay. also going to be showing things that are in your ship, but the shop doesn't want or can't want or considers illegal so that you can know that there's not a bug occurring, basically. We recognize all this stuff, right? This is what it kind of looks like now. Quite a bit of iron in my hold and it's not missing, something hasn't gone wrong, it's just that this shop doesn't trade in that particular commodity. We are also gonna do a little bit of a visual tweak. Um, we're gonna create a, a few variations. There's gonna be, if you're in Grimhex, kind of a hacked version that looks a little bit more cruddy. If you're in the trade uh, and development district or one of the more fancy areas to buy commodities, then we will have a bit more of a showroom floor, fancy Godiva chocolate looking thing. <laughs> It's intended to kind of a chocolate reputation. Speaking of which, here is another interface that was changed quite a bit by the onslaught of building blocks development. I believe they talk about it here in the beginning. Let's see. The hands have worked on. Hey, look, it's Ben again. This is without a doubt my favorite system that I've worked on at CIG. I am so excited to see it getting into the hands of players and into the hands of other developers. This was, we so this is another, you know, uh, system that came online after that building blocks reveal. This is 2021. So about two years into that system's overhaul of all the UI. And you can see there are actual new UIs starting to come out, not just other old UIs that were being reworked in the system. 
I felt that because this is such a, a crucial part of our game, that our reputation system had to be much more evolved than uh, that of a traditional MMO. I love working on these systems that allow other systems to even happen. This is where I feel like the, the game that we've been talking about from a reputation and from an immersiveness level can start to happen. The reputation system that will essentially allow us to track values for a player's reputation with an entity. And when I say entity, that could be an NPC, an organization, heck, it could be a table. If you want, so long as it has a persistent ID with it, we can track a value against it. Still alive. I think. Not only can we track a value, we can track several values. Those values are in something that we call a scope. When we say scope, we're talking about two different things. There's affinity, which is this kind of measure of how much a entity likes you, and that's common across all these entities, NPCs, organizations, etc. Hello. A few different things affect affinity. It's going to be mostly your mission performance and more specifically actually what you do during that mission. That's Something about these UI is that there is definitely this kind of, as we've looked at these different UIs from different eras of development, I guess, and we'll get to more of the older ones here soon. Um, there's definitely like a, times where the UI looked a certain way. You can pick out, like, there's definitely going to be a, oh yeah, that's, that's pre-2024 uh, Star Citizen UI. This is like, yeah, this is like pre-2024 UI, right? And then we also have like pre-2019 UI before building blocks came in and pre-3.0 2018 UI. It's interesting how much they they just have tells. Now let's look at the HUD um, and see where, oh my God, this is just, this is back there. Well, why did I have this up? Oh my gosh, this is old stuff. 2017 UI stuff. Hmm. I don't even know specifically what I was trying to call out here. Maybe the movie glass somewhere? Lots of lore. Lots of lore. Banner Defender. All right, let's look at this beginning stuff. What okay. is this? Soon, all of our new ships will have a heat and power component. Now that the team has finished designing pipes, and begun implementing their basic structure. So here is pre 3.0 UI. Man, live works. You got y'all remember that? This is kind of what the Moby Glass looked like back then. This will manage the flow of respective elements to allow individual component contribution to ship behavior. So, for example, coolers now contribute to how much heat the system can handle rather than being statically defined by the heatsink. Anyway, we're currently replacing the old system in the new ships with this new management system. After this is done, the There's team something special about that UI back then. Date. And now the purchase Here's the old buy now, we UI. We talked about shops in our last update, and now the purchase transaction system has been re-implemented with our new replicated function system called remote methods. This system will decrease the amount of calls to the server which in turn should make purchasing things a bit more responsive. Next, we'll be working on improving the try-on mode and the client-side update to your persistent data after purchases. Since the previous update about the ultimate light switch, the light group entity also has several new features. All right, it's so that was just a little bit of a UI update, I guess. I don't know why I had that on here. Is this uh, old HUD? To you as soon as we can in the upcoming 3.0 release. Yeah, this is a pretty old HUD. All right. So here's some more, this is kind of another instance of building blocks being used to update some UIs. I think the mining UI actually. It's so much easier. Players couldn't even see what was directly in their cargo holds, which we thought what exactly it was. Right, a lot of so. The were sort of theory crafting a lot of this stuff to try and figure out what exactly it was. So here's the pre 
building blocks UI that they were using for mining. This was the first mining HUD we really got. They were dealing with. Players couldn't even see what was directly in their cargo holds, which we felt was something that we could also uh, amend. We change it now to building blocks, which is so much easier. First of all, it's a lot cleaner and a lot easier to read. It's going to react a lot better with like higher brightness conditions, and every other designer can learn to use it and just go ahead and make tweaks and changes. This is to tomatoes it. here. So in 3.12, we're going to get this new streamlined UI. The flight UI, for example, we felt that we could provide at least some of the flight UI information, such as your throttle speed and your current velocity. I got water. Which means that you, there'll be no nasty surprises like, I'm in decoupled mode and I don't realize it, and I'm, I'm drifting and I don't know why. Anything else that was catching players out, such as accidentally flying into the ground when trying to mine a deposit. So uh, we felt that that was kind of helpful to have. Besides this one, we added now the functionality where you can see which consumables you have equipped on your ship at a quick glance. You see icons for them. You see which ones are active at this moment, how long they have before they expire, how long they will take, what's the cooldown. Basically, the UI got a lot more useful, a lot more modular. They could do a lot more with it in a smaller amount of time. That's a lot of what building blocks did for them. Let's jump into inventory, but I really wanted to show you... Actually, no, let's jump into maps first. So here is the first version of the star map in game. Obviously not anywhere near finished. Ow, shot me in the foot, but this is all the way. <laughs> shot me in the toes. This is, um, this is all the way back in 2013. Obviously it was more conceptual than anything, but fun to look at. Oh my God, that music. I feel like this must have been Chris Roberts, the um, ringtone at the time. Remember we used to have websites where you'd go to download ringtones? <laughs> Just like one at a time and go through all the weird sounds. This is an exciting evolutionary piece. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a new star map. This is a look at the map. This is the first time they ever showed us what they wanted the interior map to look like in 2019. Um, first time they ever even really told us we were going to have interior maps from what I remember, but again, I wasn't here the whole time. Um, yeah, we'll look at this and then I'll show you kind of the, the technology they've come up with for it. Working on a new 3D map feature that will make traversal easier. Here is Simon Bursey with more. So the area we're working on right now is called uh, the, the local area map. So we have the star map in the game, so this is the equivalent of when you're walking around on foot. At the moment, we're at the end of the pre-visualization phase. The, the first thing was, is it going to be 2D or 3D? Everybody wanted to do 3D. So we did a test out and it, it looked, looked pretty good. There's also things like, do we want to be able to see the enemy characters on there? So we did a little test for that. Um, also, it was interesting how we work out how the player moves between floors looking at the map. So how they look at the next floor up, next floor down, that kind of thing. It's a case of uh, working out how to make that in the game in a functional way. So, UI team itself is, is fairly small and there's all these big systems in the game that this links in with. So um, we have to deal with the other teams, for example, that we have to work out how we get that, the map information from the level, where do we store the locations of all the items, all that kind of thing. So there's, there's lots of things to talk about with the rest of the studio to get this done. And also, it's a, it also needs a certain level of cool, so you know, what about it looks good and makes it a bit different to, to other games. At the moment it doesn't have that quite that level of visual polish that we want, so we want it to look, we want it to be as good as what you'd see in a sci-fi movie, for example. So just now it's, it's functional and it's fine, uh, but we don't want fine, we want it to look really good. As the game's got bigger, obviously there's more places to get lost now, so that having a map is, has become more important. All right, so that's one. Now here is a look at how that technology progressed and what it turned into. Um, 
Actually, you know what? This is just gonna show you. Here's what it progressed and turned into. Let's download it to our data bank. As you'll notice, we now have the representation of the environment in, our, in the upper left corner of our visor. Now, the thing that's really interesting to note at this point is not all environments up in our mobile glass because this is going to get really interesting. So, Bone, I would like you to cycle the, the, between the different floors for us, please. So you can see this lurping transition between... The, between Did he just say slurping transition? <laughs> <laughs> just made Mrs. Tomato spit out her drink. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he said... So you can see the slurping transition. <laughs> Those oh lurping. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I was like, are, are those the excited gamer noises? The all right. So here is concept versus um, reality with transitions and everything. So, Bone, I would like you to cycle the, the, between the different floors for us, please. So you can see this lurping transition between the different floors and marker Swear he says slurping. objective and also where we are. I would like to talk a little bit about the tech behind this. What you're seeing is not a pre-baked asset. And I want to reiterate that because all of, our all of our environments can be very dynamic, and they can change. They can take damage. Perhaps uh, economic shifts might cause changes in the environment. And we can't export a totally custom assets. Um, so what we've done is we collaborate with our graphics team to enable us to render the environment in this way. And what it is is we're actually whitelisting objects that we render and excluding everything that we don't need to render. So, so that, that's, that's a little evolution of the map. I think it's a, a good look at like, they had an idea in mind and honestly, I thought it looked pretty bad when they showed us it. <laughs> um, but I really like the way that it turned out in the actual game. It looks, it looks great. Um, it works pretty good. You can scan inside of it. And my favorite part, personally, is that you come to these map terminals. Representation of and I'm really hoping the way this works is that, yeah, you have the mini-map in the game. Um, you have your mini-map of whatever area you're in, but it doesn't give you the actual like labels and, and points of interest until you go to the data bank and download from a terminal. And you make these terminals super easy to find, right? So you add them to the new player tutorial. You make it so that they are basically right outside the hangars when somebody arrives at the, sta at the, um, at the location. But like you add in this idea that maps are things to acquire and store and sell. And that's almost like a baby step into data running and exploration for people without them even noticing it. So I, I hope they stick to this idea and incorporate this. Maybe not in 323. I hope in 323 because it'd be weird to change it afterward. Um, but I'm certainly hoping that they keep the download maps in 323. If we can actually take this on the go. So let's download it to our data bank. That's pretty cool in my opinion. All right, let's go back to the HUD changes and what we saw at that time. What is this? This would be interaction. Okay. I don't think I have, oh man, the old interaction system. That's right. That's what I wanted to find. To don't ask with. me how this ended up being found, but looks like we got the interaction system here. So this is what it used to look like. And oh my God, it was very bad. 
first with the rollout of 3.0, then testing the expanding universe from there. Yeah. This is also part of item 2.0 where you could start to interact with everything. Check it out. And speaking of the 3.0 rollouts, up next we see how the new interaction system influences every aspect of gameplay. Take a look. The player interaction system touches everything. It's a unified interaction which, uh, to, across first person, uh, the experience of shooting, of shopping, of uh, looting when you go up to screens and you interact with those terminals, and also when you get into your cockpit, you fly your ship around, and being able to point at things, you know, with reckless abandon actually opens up a lot of opportunity for interactions of uh, I want to find out more about that and we can give back contextual clues of the things that you can do. So the uh, player interaction system um, that we're starting to show here is the third version of the interaction system that we've had in the game. Yes, um, the yes, third version. This was 2017. The first five years of development of this game were a whole kind of journey. This was when they first started to actually get their their stuff together in terms of the interaction and everything. Um, but even then, you're just now starting to see the fruits of the labor behind this whole thing because they had to rebuild all this with building blocks. The original uh, interaction system is what was in the game in uh, Alpha 2.5 and previous. And it was this kind of mishmash of different approaches to try to figure out the freaking what, dreaded use key. Y'all remember that? What the player was looking at and what they were trying to interact with in the game. Uh, after that, um, we made an item 2.0 interaction system that tried to be more accurate about what you were interacting with. And so it would use raycasts and collision geometry to figure out the results. Um, that had some issues as far as usability. And so we're adding some new. Uh, features onto the current item to bono interaction system that makes it more contextually aware about what you're interacting with. Our old system, uh, it was basically the dreaded use system that basically, you know, we had the bounding box that had to be inside and then you can only really have one action tied to that and, you know, it wasn't very descriptive, it was just use, right? And that's why it's kind of deemed as the use system. To get the player interaction system going, it really required a pretty fundamental rewrite of uh, the interface we would use to interact with objects within the game. Um, for example, for the um, first couple of years on the project, we were so used to just having the big, horrible use prompt on everything. God, it was terrible. And uh, really, that sort of not only did that not Like, we're good, going from that use system to... To this, Sorry. like, super contextual, pick what you want the action to be kind Here of system. Here you can see the prompts that change depending on your focus. The let's bring up the wheel. And, you know, I really like my plushies, so I want to inspect them when I... No, I'm, uh, you know, I don't know how I feel about the wheel. I like the functionality of this. Not sure about the design, but it's obviously quite better than than this but system. It also sort of always felt clunky. It was very hard to actually get in the right spot to use stuff, so... We had to really sort of come up with a design that gave the kind of level of detail that we wanted to uh, uh, put into the game for the users to actually be able to interact with things um, that are present in the levels to the level of detail uh, that would immerse them in the gaming experience. So to really make all that happen the easiest way was to just basically write a lot of this from the ground up, write it, write as a fresh new system. There's some, to, there's that customization that we were looking at before. Uh, just going with the old used stuff. I did a prototype of cargo. Uh, some of the, the earliest, you know. Look at the interiors of the ships back then. Jankiest bits of that that we've done. And as part of that, I did a little section in, in a freelancer that would detect that you brought a thing in and then showed up on a cargo manifest screen, which was the first time that I made a, th a thing with a cursor on it. Eventually, that turned into MFDs and how you interact with, with that stuff in your, the screens in your cockpit. Uh, 
and then eventually became, well, that's should, we should unify all of these you know, exponentially growing input systems to something that actually has a, uh, a core to it. This is a whole completely new system that's coming in. No, this is before the other new system that was coming in. It's really fascinating to see um, how this all progressed and changed. When I was talking about this, um, I meant I'm not crazy about the design in terms of like the aesthetics of it. Uh, but I, I, I can respect the wheel because I am a person who likes to use different forms of control and this ends up capturing all of them fairly well rather than benefiting one mainly. But this is a PC game, so I think things that benefit mouse and keyboard first are, you know, kind of expected. Um, I'll have to see how this plays out. I don't really use the wheel in the game right now. I need to start using it and get a better feel for it and see if that works for me or not. I find them around, so I'm changing that to my primary. And you'll see that does not affect only the item they are interacting with, but any item that falls into the same category. But the other part of our focus was to bridge the disconnection between the player and the object you are interacting with. In a fully physicalized world that we want to provide you, a tactile experience is very important to sell the experience. So we've introduced a new system that allows... This game is crazy about the double vision. I don't know what it is or why, but you see it all over the place. They didn't used to have it. Everything used to be flat. What is this? What are we looking at here? Oh, okay, so this was this was um, prior to the video we just watched. This was the interaction system. So 2022, I believe. So you can see here, this is in Asiado, which we've already showcased. Uh, but this is obviously going in and utilizing some of our new building blocks UI for the doors. And then here's a scan wave, and you can see that, that I'm looking at that data pad, and then it, you can move around, and it's giving me that information. So right now, it's just giving you the basic high-level information in terms of the names and things. Uh, but you will also have more detailed information depending on, you know, contextually what the item is. And what you're seeing here is part of the player interaction system. So you can just, even though that's kind of, of a complex area, there's lots of little things that you can interact with, but you're getting confidence of, oh cool, I can, I can grab that or I can use the data pad. And you, you're not having to go into interact mode, you're not having to be driven by the cursor. You can go in and just press F or interact with it. And you know, you've probably seen this in plenty of AAA games, but they don't have the detail and at scale that we do. So we wanted to make sure that that system is really robust, but hopefully it, it gives you kind of yeah. an idea of. And, I, and I'd also for. say that like, part of the idea is that, that you know, there's. Yeah. So that's, that was an interim period. That was before this. So they, ex they advanced from that, that to this. To my primary, and you'll you can see tell that this looks a little bit more polished, but you know, some people like myself, the design might not be there for it. Um, what is this? Is this showing us the HUD updates? Yeah, this is quite a few HUD updates coming to 2021. And then I'm going to show you the 3D elements they started to add over time. I think this is another Building Blocks UI update. Let's listen in. On the gameplay front, there are several advancements to ship and vehicle operation coming in Alpha 314 that aim to further improve the combat and flight experience, including Power Management V2, formerly referred to here as capacitors, designed to rebalance all the connected systems that make ships go. From thrusters to weapons to shields, Adding another layer of critical decision making to combat is just one more way to put the successful outcome of any battle more squarely in players' hands. There's also Missile Operator Mode and the rework to Missile Guidance and Control, which not only brings about a new way to interact with and control the variety of munitions available on ships and vehicles, but improves the way they handle themselves in the verse by bringing the same intelligent flight control system pilots use for spacecraft to their missiles and torpedoes. This has the effect of improving both performance and tracking ability while providing skilled pilots a way to use their talents in avoiding death and destruction. A revitalization of the way radar, scanning, and ping work throughout the Star Citizen universe is another essential addition to the upcoming Alpha 314, with detailed and consistent means of discovery, distraction, and potentially destruction. Now this new unified system with its upcoming FPS counterpart will form the foundation of a new and improved level of investigation, cat and mouse chase, and more for the future, 
while changing the way players interact with content already in the game today. And of course, all of these new systems are displayed better than ever before with the new Canvas Slice HUD, a tech made possible by our continuing development of building blocks that there it is to provide an improved layout there it is that maximizes screen real estate while providing more opportunities for increased information and the groundwork for allowing manufacturer specific visual designs like the Aegis one we've seen before and the Drake version currently being developed now. Oh, you know what? That's really good. Hold on. Where would that be? All right. This is this is actually a pretty big one. Let's watch this in its entirety because they talk a lot about how the UI is going to change around ships. This is actually the first time we ever got to see a mini map in the game. So this is a previous video, right? Maybe two seconds. It's all about the HUD, but they have a little transition here that they totally snuck in the Easter egg. And to, to tie into the backstory. Up there, top left hand corner. Actually, top left and top right. They kind of show us the idea for a mission objective and a mini map for the first time. And that was that was the reference I used every single time I ever thought about a mini map coming in. Um, but yeah, let's watch this because this is a pretty big deal moment for the HUD changing over to building blocks and setting up the HUD that we're getting now in Squadron. Trying to translate that across, trying to hit that, that feeling, it is quite difficult because for the HUD, for example, there's something like 40 or 50 different pieces of information you've got to show. Functionality is our, our main thing. So we have to try and look at those, those movements and try to extract those elements, but still apply them to the game UI. So where shall I start? Tell you what, I'll begin at the beginning. So um, we decided that the UI in the game is OK, but we really want to kind of up the, the quality bar on it. Aegis combat assist activated. We have a fairly comprehensive list of what we needed to be displayed on the HUD. What's there in game at the moment doesn't cover all of that. There were two major pushes towards getting the Aegis style right. The first of those, we kind of focused on the look mainly. So there's a lot of design considerations. For example, we want to make sure that everything's got a decent amount of space. Legibility is a big thing. If you've got text in there, it needs to be big enough to see. We also try and make similar things look similar. So if you have a button, it needs to look like a button. Also, we want to avoid things like overlaps. You don't want things to be on top of each other. And in general, with the new HUD as well, what we're trying to do is keep the flight information on the left and save the right hand side for kind of all right. specific. For reference, because now we're all wondering, wait, what does it look like right now? Let's go into CitizenCon 2023 and double check what they're showing us now when it comes to these MFDs and stuff. All I'm right, so this is what we're at. Because the video we're watching right now is about where they want to go. You know what, maybe we should actually continue that first. Let's keep watching this. This is again, the ideas that they set out in 2020 for what they want the UIs to look like in Aegis ships. So during the design process for this phase, we took the opportunity to add in some much requested uh, fan favorite features, such as having a compass, uh, which will aid in navigation, both in atmosphere and space. And between those two modes, it's either relative to the planet or relative to the galactic plane and a radar altimeter. So in game at the moment, you do sort of have a altimeter, but it's sort of, it's only relative to the the perfect Z0 height of the planet. So mountains aren't accounted for, whereas this will account for that. With the design dock in hand, we went ahead and made our, our second push on the concepts. Once we have the general look of it sketched out, then it's on to making the visual target. So we'll, we'll get the, the artist to come up with the final artistic look of it. And once everybody's happy with that, then we kind of punt it back to the designers and say, OK, is this working for you? And uh, quite often, to start with, the answer is no, it's not. <laughs> so what they're interested in is that, hey, maybe it looks nice, but they really want to get across, get across all the gameplay information. So we might tweak around the positions of a few elements, but it's things like make sure the fonts are big enough, make sure that the bars are strong enough. Then we pass that back to the artist and there's kind of this cycle goes on for a, a little while while the designers kind of give their feedback and the artist kind of tries to address it and eventually we get somewhere where everybody's happy. I think what we've ended up with after after all this uh, kind of concept and design work is something that's is quite unique for a game because it's been it's been very well designed and it's also had a lot of time visually to try and get it looking good. So if we look at the final concept we'll go over some of the features that are there now. 
If we start at the top, this is where all your warning messages are primarily. So these will cascade in um, and much like the current version, they, they will be colored to indicate severity. Uh, directly underneath that is a new element dealing with your emissions or signatures and sort of infrared cross section and EM signature relative to the background, uh, which is going to be very cool for stealth gameplay. And then we have sort of the main piece of the, the HUD, which is much wider than we currently have. And that has everything to do with your velocity, thrust capacity, your thrust amount, uh, your Y'all stop amount, bullying Terrible Bishop in chat. Vertical bearings <laughs> He's still and learning. Uh, altitude above the ground. Underneath there, we have two little spherical widgets, which is sort of your 3D velocity indicator, because quite often in space, uh, where you're pointing is not where you are actually heading, so these will give you some visual indication of that in 3D. And then right at the very bottom we have your sort of status warning, so whether you're in coupled or decoupled, whether ESP is on, whether you're in VTOL mode, your landing gear, uh, your countermeasure status, and then finally bottom right is what sort of weapon firing mode you're in, whether it's auto gimbals here, manual gimbals, or fixed. So in the background, while while the visual development's been continuing, we've been working on the building block stuff, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about. One of the key things we've done recently is this system where we can layer the UI, so we can have like layers of flat UI, uh, which lets us achieve this sort of three-dimensional hologra holographic look. And then we'll be handing all that stuff over to the vehicle feature team so they can actually start to implement it. So the next steps at the moment, we're just uh, we're just finalizing what the MFDs are going to look like. And as you probably know, there's loads of other manufacturers in the game. So potentially we'll work on something like RSI or Anvil or Drake next. So go through the same process. But because we've done the first one already, that process should be a lot quicker now. And as we as we get through more, we'll, we'll get into a good flow. Of course. To okay, find my so that's um, obviously not the HUD we got. But um, it also obviously is pretty derivative of the one we get. In fact, check this out. If you look at this and then you go to CitizenCon 2022 and look at the HUD that they say was actually not the HUD they want to go forward with. It was an over-designed HUD, which obviously was that one that we just looked at. They brought it into the game and they tooled it back to what we have now, which we're about to get to. But if you look at that kind of interim one at 2022, it almost matches that exactly. All right, so this is this was their previous sort of concept. YouTube, and you get one more time here. What this looks like? Uh, let's take a look at the quantum boost clip that we. It's have. pretty close. Uh, so we can see it one more time here. So just to call out, that's that is the really alt -hud. dang close. Yeah, that is the alt hud. That's too busy. Right, that's so. the next alt hud. <laughs> yeah. Earlier yeah. we were showing the old old hud. So we've done a scan here. Those are that's also the old point of interest because the point of interest will be just points yeah but basically we've done a scan we've got some points of interest that are uh you know multiple 10ks away but yeah they said this was too busy and you know i think it was easy to agree at that point that it was there was a lot going on all right now here is what they settled on So you can see now that you won't directly grab the control stick. You'll be put on this, this relaxed pose with free look enabled. And you can see the different prompts appear over the buttons. So let's get this show started and get your ship ready for flying. So Brent, if you could close the canopy so we don't go flying around with that open. Power our systems. And that. take note before when they said Aegis has their specific HUD, but so will RSI and Consolidated Outland and, and all the other companies. I don't remember what their names are, Drake and stuff. They're all going to have their own uh, HUDs as well. It's going to be interesting to see how different they are. Aegis combat assist. And finally, turn our engines. Yeah, so we are, you are now ready for flying. So we will be, be bringing all of this to all of our ships in our fleet. And that's all from me, so please... Well, join me in welcoming to the stage Tony to tell you all about the new UI.
Hi, everyone. My name is Tony. I'm senior UI programmer here at CIG. And I'm here to explain some of the spoilers that you saw yesterday about our new Ship UI. So are you ready to see the Ship UI in action? Yeah. <laughs> right. Bone, play the demo. The, I mean, Brandt, continue with the demo. So as you can see already, this ship has less intrusive UI with more space to enjoy the stunning vistas that planets can offer and less clutter views so you can focus during combat. This also means that the UI elements are now more relevant to the situation, linked to the operator mode. For example, when we change to scan mode, the crosshair has scanning information about your target, and even the MFDs have changed. Some of these elements can be customized, but we'll see more about that later. For this demo, we're showing the UI developed for this Gladius. Basic information related to navigation will always be available on your view, and this Gladius displays all of that with holograms around the dashboard. But other ships may have different layouts and styles on brand with the manufacturer. For example, the Drake that makes more affordable ships, rather than fancy and probably expensive holograms, may use physical screens, dials, and light indicators. This dashboard shows your current speed, the remaining afterburn, and some decoys available. On both far sides, we have status indicators that will show things like if your landing gear is on or any, any other flight systems. Worth mentioning that we have prototyped these for the demo, so right now they are holograms, but on the final design, these are going to be physical screens. On the far left, on the top of the dashboard, we have the indicator of which master mode and operator mode are you on. So let's change that to combat and talk about these new MFDs. So we have reworked all of these MFDs from scratch with brand new views using our UI technology building blocks. We can still navigate through this. There it is again. The classic mouse interaction, holding F and then moving the mouse. On the left here, we can see the scanning view, which is going to show information that you obtain when you scan a target. It may show information about the ship name, the pilot name, or even the current operator mode of your target, so you know if they are just chilling around or they are ready to fight you. Cycling to the left one, we have the target status, which will focus on emissions, damage, and orientation of your target. We'll see that in action later. The next one, continuing to the left, will be the self status, which is contextual. So during navigation, that will show your current fuel. But during combat, like right now, will show information about your guns. You can click on the gun, and you can see basic information about that. You will see the name, and you can also see in which group they are assigned, which Yogi will explain later. On the MFT on the right side, we have the power management, where we can distribute the power of different systems of the ship. You can click on the triangle and move it around to change the distribution, and you can turn down the total power of the ship that will generate. The classic key bindings that you all know already works. So when you change the power management, you will see now a triangle on top of the radar to show you the changes. Now, instead of using mouse, you can also use key bindings to select MFDs and cycle through the views, which might be faster when you are in certain situations like during combat. And for those pop players out there, we have added about 100 key bindings, and I mean 100, to navigate through all of these systems. So you can fully customize how you want to navigate through them. And I really hope that's more than enough to use on your keyboard, on your HOTAS, or even on your game class setup. But if you need more, just let us know. Anyway, I think you're not going to need even thus many shortcuts. For this operator mode, we now persistently save which views are shown on each MFD. So you can customize what's important to you for every situation. So as an example, during combat, you might want to have target information on your MFDs. But maybe when you change to quantum travel, have your current fuel, spend some time on the configuration screen, for example. Let's talk about this configuration screen. We're going to have now here a variety of options, from customizing UI elements to enable systems of the ship. We may see some of these later in action with Yogi. These settings are now available on this screen, not in the global settings of the game, for quick access. 
So it's just a warning, expect changes on the settings that you already know, but we'll tell you all about it when we have it ready. All right. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna come back to ship UI in a little bit, uh, but let's look at the 3D building blocks because we've been talking about building blocks a lot here. But there's actually a pretty key moment where building blocks really started to. What is this? Oh my god! I forgot to show you guys the early Moby glass. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Check this out. This is fun. Who remembers that? This was the Moby Glass before. Hey, how are you? Miles Eckhart. Friend over Crusader said you've been building quite a rep. I run a modest security outfit, and I'm always on the lookout for capable people who don't rattle. If you're interested in picking up some extra work, we should talk. I'll send my details. Uh, so in the games come... That was, like, mainly a pre-recorded segment, but that was... That was what the Moby Glass menu used to look like. That's funny. Here's what it looks like now, or it's going to look like. Right now, it's kind of like the overview. So Much you know, different overview. change. This is the Squadron 42 focused one, though, not the uh, Star Citizen one. Now, this was uh, summer 2022. They were showcasing some of the latest advancements they'd made with building blocks, which was to make basically 2D, 2D art in like a 3D format as like a holographic UI asset. So check out kind of what they were doing with it more than spaceships to show us. Well, it's still a little bit early, but I suppose we can tease this look at recent tests of the UI card system, a brand new way to take building blocks and display it dynamically and diegetically throughout the persistent universe in Squadron 42. Just don't tell anyone. So what did we learn? All right, now let's go back to this uh, shot here. It's like very, and then look at this recent shot. God dang it, just lost the dramatic effect. That was stupid. This, I'm pretty sure is the same technology. Um, it, it, only, it only took them two years. <laughs> it took about, what, a year? No, two years or so, almost two years to get the technology sort of into a, um, a you know, a, a, I guess an application that makes sense in the PU. But a lot of these systems that we've seen over these years that just kind of like came and went in a sprint report or they got talked about briefly or like, you know, you even look back to like some of these ones where we're, <laughs> this is 20 freaking, 2019. 2019 like there's a lot of this stuff that just people think got forgotten and now is showing up in the game in the game. different places because you know that they've grown out their teams enough or they've um managed to get rid of a lot of the blockers that were in the way of these things or they got building blocks working so that the rest of the company could start to build ui without having to use the ui team's time just a lot of things are finally coming around and i think ui is another good sign of that in a lot of different ways. I mean, almost all the UI we've looked at today is getting updated in some way. We can go back and look at the the, the old inventory system. All right, guys. Great. What's what's next? Yikes, Aronis. A couple of releases ago, we released inventory. Yes, this uh, is live. This first iteration. When we come to release, somebody come look at this. Somebody come look at this. What this this was this was the first inventory. Oh my lord. 3.10 too. This isn't like pre 3.0 time, folks. This is 13 patches ago. That's not that long. Oh my gosh. <laughs> For these things, it's not always at a stage where we're ready to go 100%. Like it felt so... This was the most alpha feature I think I have ever used in my life. There are other things in this game that, that are, you know... They get that, but like, look at how you open this inventory. Things, it's not always at a stage where... You press a button and this little dot appears on the screen and then you click the dot and the inventory just... 
we're ready to go 100%. It's not 100% polish. No, I appreciated it. I loved it. I loved having it in the game. We were finally able to carry stuff with us, but just, like, look at this progress. Gosh. Uh, but we still need to provide something so that the base fe functionality of that feature we've requested is provided. But the, the benefits of it may not be obvious to the players at when they're playing it, but it's it's immense for us because we get feedback. If you guys play something um, and you hate it, then us knowing that early on is so much better than finding out, you know, a year down the line when we've put a year's worth of work into it. In the next iteration, the feature is being iterated on to allow players. See, now this was the next patch. Like they got rid of that pretty quick, but this still was not fun to use. Players to interact with imagery outside of themselves. Uh, and that's yes, yes, yes. F's in chat for Bordalo. Sorry, I know, folks. I know. It hurts. Someday, you see, even the birds out there, they're like, what the flippity f happened to my Bordalo on you mother f I'm going to f you up. Ah. It's going to be with a new user interface. So the inventory is still accessed the same way as it was previously. Uh, the player can either go to the personal inner thought and click on the, the inventory slot, or then press the key bind that the by default is Y. And that will bring the inventory screen. On the left side of the screen, the player will see the different containers that currently has equipped. These containers can be equipped through the PMA. like And like this is... I think it's a big deal that these are the same developers, the same developers that are coming out um, on the stage at CitizenCon, at CitizenCon, at CitizenCon. <laughs> Where is this dang thing? Here. Like, these are the same developers that are showing us these UI that are clearly much, much better. It's not like they hired new people that just knew how to do UIs. They, that's just like the different point in their development time. Um, and we were just guinea pigging it back then, apparently. So the inventory is still accessed the same way as it was previously. Uh, the player can either go to the personal inner thought and click on the, the inventory slot, or then press the key bind that the by default is Y. And that will bring the inventory screen. On the left side of the screen, the player will see the different containers that currently has equipped. These containers can be equipped through the PMA, like uh, before. And then every time an item is stored, uh, this will appear, they will be stored on these containers. Within these screens, the player can see the, uh, the current capacity, which currently um, container is being used, because previously you didn't have access to that. And then the player has access to all the inventory management uh, functionalities, that being drag and drop between different containers, uh, it can stack the, uh, items of the same type, it can split because by default uh, an item of the same type is stacked together, so it can split some of them, switch part of them to another container, and then uh, of course you can access to the contextual menu of the item and then have the, the same interaction you had previously that are available for that item, that being carry, drink, equip and so on. The tech that makes this feature possible is building blocks. Uh, I'm sure you've heard a, a bit about that over the past few months. It really has revolutionized the way we develop the UI, and I think it's um, uncorked a bottle, uh, allowing much more to be done, which is great. Uh, in terms of one of the things that we're not quite happy with yet is the hollow shader. It looks great on some of the objects, uh, so some of the commodities look okay, but there are others, say like a, a bottle of water or whatnot, it just really doesn't pick out the detail enough. Uh, so that's something that the graphics team and the UI tech team work together to give us an improvement on. When it does, I think it's going to make a, a big improvement. Building blocks again. With this iteration of the inventory, you can also have the possibility. So you can to start to see. Access. You start to see like how these things are getting updated. See, this one still has that mining overlay that we learned earlier got its own building blocks update. So this inventory system came before that mining systems update, and probably you know the personal HUD inventory or the personal HUD system building blocks overlay is somewhere in here too. It's just like. This whole time was just this turbulent period of we got to get these basic versions of each UI in so that we could start to build on top of them. Um, is man, 
but it all it came together. And of the inventory, you can also have the possibility to access inventories that are external to the player. So in uh, currently, the use case we have is the green rock. The intention is to allow you to interact with things outside of your character and then interact with uh, the inventory within that. So if you're wandering around um, with your multi-tool lasering rocks uh, and your inventory is getting full, you can just go and add them to the contents of uh, your, your backpack into the back of your green rock instead. Future releases, we're definitely going to see a lot more um, using this feature. What I'm personally looking forward to is I already enjoy making corpses, but at some point I'm going to be able to start riffling through them and seeing what's in their inventory as well. And that's, that's, that's really exciting. Uh, this is inventory stuff. What was this? This is, I think, a little bit more inventory development. Let's not forget the new Building Blocks grid interface for player inventory that separates the storage between backpack, chest, and pants, and the ability to transfer between them while adding new functionality yeah. that allows players to access inventories external to the player. See, this was a really crappy looking inventory, but the functionality it brought was essentially the same functionality we have now. External storage, backpack, armor slots. This was like the big step forward. It just didn't look great. Um, and I think that was their main goal. Let's just get a functioning inventory in and then we'll make it look better someday in the future. And that's what they're doing now with this kind of stuff. We'll fit that weapon. You can then quickly loot those or attach the weapon attachments. Which I mean, you can like I said, back then when they were doing these, where the heck are they? Back when they were doing this stuff, they did not care about quality of life. Look at the freaking detail on this, right? They, they just wanted to get something that functioned in there. This though, this little addition of the light up whenever you scroll over a weapon and it tells you what it can use. Ooh, yes, make me lazier CIG, come on. We also have some contextual actions in the loot screen. If you are looking for ammo for a specific weapon, you can hover over that weapon and it will show you any magazines or attachments that will fit that weapon. You can then quickly loot those or attach the weapon attachments using that menu. So when the player hovers a specific item, this will appear a tooltip that will tell you the available actions, and that will include, for example, a single click to equip, a shift left, left click to store it. We've also added a button to the loot screen to swap between that and the existing personal inventory view. The inventory will stay, it's not going anywhere, uh, and it's more for your management. So what you're seeing here is still, uh, the visuals are still for Squadron. We are planning to do a PU version, and that will come for this release. Interesting that they don't have it ready to be shown, but it should be ready for the release. This is where they're showing us off the new HUD, which, you know, I think going back throughout the years, if you go and look at some of our talks about the new player experience and what to expect with it. One of the biggest things that I always said would be great was a system that allowed you to do stuff like this, scan your surroundings and then get labels for the things that you were looking at. Um, I feel like that's gotta be one of the biggest changes that they're making to the HUD that's gonna help people out. So there's a lot of like little things that they're bringing in, like FPS radar and scanning was never even something they brought into the game before, never worked. We just never had the ability to navigate in FPS. No, no compass, um, no ability to scan, no ability to identify anything you looked at. If you shot somebody, if you saw someone, you couldn't tell if they were your friend, they were a pirate, like nothing. So this on its own is a big change and it's not even an update to an existing system. And if you haven't seen it, this is what the new kind of FPS visor is gonna work like when you're uh, scanning and identifying stuff. Gonna be important for a bounty hunter for sure. Go on, Bone. Let's walk forwards a bit. Okay. Now we fix the damage. We need to find the enemies that caused it. While we're on the way, you'll notice that the on foot emissions at the top of the screen. We're emitting infrared, electromagnetic radiation, and also sound. If any of these go higher than the background levels, it will be easier for the enemies to detect us. Let's take a look at the bad guys, Bone. As part of the emissions and radar tech, we also have the ability to scan while we're on foot. If we tap the button, we can do a quick scan to reveal everything 
to reveal info about anything that's in our, in our view currently. OK, Baron, let's do a quick scan. This highlights whatever's in our line of sight. There's also some risk and reward to the scanning system. By holding the button, we can charge our scanner, and this reveals, this reveals enemies through walls using a more powerful wave. But it does cause a spike in our emissions, which makes us easier to detect. OK, let's do a charge scan, please, Bone. OK. We can also see the augmented reality box outs, which give us a summary of what we've detected. OK, let's have a look at our weapons. Let's get the gun out, gun out please, Bone. OK, we wanted to help the player see their equipment during combat, so we upgraded the weapons display. As well as the ammo in the gun and the spare mags in their pockets, we also now show the player's explosives and med pens. OK, let's fight the bad guys. Wow, I wish grenades there just you can see our new explosive works. marker, designed to help you spot deadly grenades, mines, and missiles more easily. See, that messes me up. Because I, I have trouble understanding if that guy on the left was behind cover or not. Obviously, he is if you're focusing on him. But if I'm focusing on the person in my scope then I might assume that that person on the left is behind cover and not realize that they have a clear shot on me. So that kind of, that, that see-through view, and this might not be the best example for, an, or the best situation to make that an example, but some of you might get what I'm saying. When you can see through walls, it gets a little bit harder to understand when you're actually looking through a wall and, and not. Okay, hold on, Bone. Success. Okay. Uh, there's no more hostiles nearby, so let's take a moment to talk about the Moby Glass. The Moby Glass is the Star Citizen equivalent of your smartphone. It has various apps that hook into the gameplay systems. Like all the UI we're showing you today, we wanted to redesign it with the player's usability in mind to make it look good and also lay the, lay the groundwork for future expansion. Uh, let's bring up the Moby Glass, please, Bone. Pretty cool, huh? We've redesigned the interface to give a smoother user experience. We've overhauled the visuals, as you can see, to make it feel more three-dimensional and holographic. Oh, that's this the call to prayer. Uh, let me close the window there. One second. All right. Moby Glass. How did that change from this to what we have now? They showed that off in this one, right? Did we get to see the Moby Glass? Depending on what you're looking at. So if you've got your Moby Glass open, it can hide a lot there of the widgets. Maybe it's so the difference between that and... Oh, man. So many tabs still. This. There we go. Yeah, they definitely changed it up quite a bit. Um, even from... This is October 24th, 2023 to... March 28th, 2024. It's like six months, five, six months. Mostly moved things around, but sectioned it out a little bit differently. Changed up the way the buttons display on the bottom. What do you guys like? You like this more or you like this one more? I actually think I like this better.
Looks a little bit less... Uh, looks a little cleaner. You want both? So yeah, Off. that's kind of the mini evolution of the Moby Glass, but we already looked at the really, really old one. Which I guess they don't have a better shot of in here than the one I just showed you. But it literally used to just be this little menu that would open up. Like, when you open this, it would literally just open this, like, grouping of windows like this. And then you just click on one. It's a different kind of system from what we have now. This stuff. Sneak peek of the UEE military Moby Glass we've created for Squadron 42. Yeah, this is the Squadron Two. Moby Glass. Alright, last bit to look at is the uh, new star map. Guess we could look at the old star map first. Oh, here's the old Moby Glass. Didn't look too much different from what we have now. We really want to adjust that. So now we've got the actual control to uh, specify these offsets for the Moby Glass. And it's a game with- And you guys know the, uh, the current star map. Star map. More. Um, that's, that's got a lot of work to doing to kind of make it more usable, more readable, use the space that we now have. I think that was kind of constrained before. So we've got a lot more space now. So using the space better for the star map. So it's, it's more intuitive because I think that's going to be once you've got your kit and you've got your ship, finding where to go is, is the next big thing. So we've got something that works, but making that better. We've also got things like the journal um, and other secondary apps that you're not going to be using all the time that we want to make sure work really well. So they'll be coming through um, down the line. And then in terms of the VMA and PMA, those apps, they've still got a whole bunch of stuff that needs to come in. We want to improve um, the stat readout. At the moment, there's just kind of basic information and basic size information, but as a whole. All right, here we go. I think we're going to see the star map here. We don't, we don't get a view of the star map. I could have sworn. Um, this was before they needed to consider an entire solar system or star system. Uh, it was really just Crusader. Like you can even tell here, there's nothing else around the whole system. Everything is just around Crusader. You couldn't even fly to these planets. They were just listed in the star map. Indicative of what they built that star map for. It was not a place with a bunch of different destinations and distances that you had to consider. It was a place where you could fly anywhere you wanted at any time. Um, but all of the locations were within like 30 seconds of travel from you. So it was a very simplified system. And they've been sitting on that system all the way up until now. Now we finally have the new one, and if I can find the correct tab, I'll show you what it looks like. What if, what if, what happens? Have we, have we tried this? Have we, what happens if we just, just take your mouse wheel and just zoom out a little bit? Keep going. Zo keep zooming out all the way out, all the way out. Let's go, let's go. So, it's not just the interior map, it's not just the radar, it is the map. It is one single unified system just across different scales. And I want, at this point, we are above Crusader, and at this point I want to invite Emily Hansen onto the stage to talk about the map as seen at this scale. Thank you very much, everybody. And if you didn't catch that, um, this is the same map he was using to walk around Orison. So the whole idea is what we, what we heard him say at the very beginning of this whole show a couple hours ago. They wanted to build a system that was the internal maps, the star map, the local map, the mini map, all of it is one system. It all renders the same things. It can zoom in and out from the same places. Um, and you can even see the minimap transitions from Orison in the top left there onto the Carrick completely seamlessly. That Carrick moves around as part of the map in Orison. And you're able to go from one map to the next. It's all one seamless system. It's really cool. And so what he's kind of showing us here um, is that they're using that same system to render ships. You can see the doors open and close. You can see components being used. You can see people walking around on your ship. Uh, it's the same thing that they're using for the engineering overlay as well. But that is why he did the whole zoom out from that ship's map, which is the same as Orison's map, which is 
all the way out to eventually the same as the star map as we're about to see here. So let's continue. As you all suspected, this is the star map. I'm so excited to be here today to reveal this to you all. I hope you're excited too. Now, I think we all know the current star map needed a bit of work. And we've done that. Now, mapping the universe is no easy task, but we've taken some big steps forward with this upgrade to make it so much easier for you to navigate the stars. Before we dive into the details, let's just take a second to admire Crusader's new look. Bone, why don't you take a look around? Much like the interior map, the star map is holographic. And this lets us add some cool interference effects and details to our planet textures. You can also see our improved player markers and that we're currently at Orison. The player and location markers have merged at this scale because they're so close together. The player marker takes priority, which is why the marker displays the player icon and color. By smartly merging with bigger points of interest at larger scales, the player this map marker definitely needs more colors. To you. But seeing as how much things have changed since we saw the um, Moby Glass compared to what it is now, remember we looked at the light blue one. I'm thinking we might see some significant changes here with this too, and hopefully it will help with the grids. Um, hopefully it'll help with the diversity of color. I think they've probably taken a lot of the criticism or feedback they've gotten on this system when first revealed and Im Im imparted it into the version we'll get with 323 if it does come. And I'm looking forward to what they have because clearly they are holding off on showing it to us. They're building the hype for the star map. They realize this is something people are waiting for a lot, and they are waiting until we get a lot closer to 323 to make a, a bigger buzz about it. Looking forward to what they got. Task, but we've taken some big steps forward with this upgrade to make it so much easier for you to navigate the stars. Before we dive into the details, let's just take a second to admire Crusader's new look. Bone, why don't you take a look around? Much like the interior map, the star map is holographic. And this lets us add some cool interference effects and details to our planet textures. You can also see our improved player markers and that we're currently at Orison. The player and location markers have merged at this scale because they're so close together. The player marker takes priority, which is why the marker displays the player icon and color. By smartly merging with bigger points of interest at larger scales, the player marker always remains visible to you. You'll always know where you are relative to points of interest near and far. So, is everyone ready to see more? Yeah. Bone, let's take the step back button. That's the one on the right over here. So we can see, take a look at Crusader and all of its moons. Crusader and yeah, its so moons. Uh, let's jump forward a little bit here. Really planet, loving the way that they display names and stuff here now. It looks so much cleaner. You could barely even see the ground locations before. Um, and I'm excited to see how when you do something on the star map to mark a location or set something, and then you go and land on the planet, that map on your, on your, like your HUD is still running on the same information you set from the star map and appear when they're in the central part of the planet, reducing on-screen clutter. Bone, want to show this in action? <laughs> Markers on the far side of the planet fade out, so they don't take focus from the locations you currently care more about on the near side of the planet. Thank Bone, you. can you double-click on one of the points of interest? That also is going to make it easier to find places. As we selected this marker, its label will stay visible at all angles. So far, we've showed you that you can use buttons and double-clicking to jump to objects you're interested in. 
but wouldn't it be nice if you could also freely zoom out and into location? Yeah, I actually really like the idea. This is like an auto highlighting tool for ground locations. It's really nice. We wanted to ensure you have freedom to move around, but this flexibility requires us to be really careful about how and when markers appear. Markers need to disappear when they get too small, but also stay visible when they're still relevant to your view. This isn't simple because objects in a solar system are vastly different sizes. Think about the size of a star versus a planet versus you, the player. You're kind of small compared to a star, right? No. Our solution is a technique we call cosmetic scaling. This allows us to draw a marker at its real size when we are close to it and artificially increase its size as we zoom out until we reach the point where it collapses into larger points of interest in the hierarchy. You can see this in action here. There's no way Crusader and its moons are this size at this scale in reality. They've been scaled up massively so you can see them. Bone, let's zoom out a bit more so we can see the moons disappear. Bloop. You can also start to see Crusaders orbit line around the sun here. But before we go back... Holmes, that's 10 million, 10 million kilometers. I love that we actually have scale on the star map now. That's so freaking... That's so back. much distance. Let's zoom back in so we can see everything come back as we get closer. As I'm well curious, as though... Um, when they, in the normal map, you see players walking around in the map, they're rendered on ships kind of moving around in the star map. Will we see ships? Like what's going to show up in this star map? What will be rendered here? Will we be able to look at a star, a space station and see ships coming in and out of it? Or will it just be like the space station rendered as just that? Cause I think they, they look at space stations up here. We've got you. We've provided a drop-down that lists the points of interest in the solar system. Bone, want to expand it now? Go over a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> We're actively working on ways to improve the way this list is presented to you to make it even easier to find what Yay, you're looking for. Text and yes, search. this will include search functionality. Yes. But for now, Bone, let's use this to go to Ariel. <laughs> I absolutely love zooming around on this map. Bone, want to find Area 18 for me? I like that. That's fun. <laughs> That's of course the sound that a star map is going to make. So, Area 18 is currently on the dark side of the planet, it seems. Of course, it's not just planets and moons. Bone, how about we take a look at security post Korea? It's quite a long way down, isn't it? This is where the upcoming search will really come in useful. Holy crap. Like, how long would it have taken to zoom into this space station in the current star map? I think I probably would have given up. Bone, want to zoom in a little and show off our holographic model of this station? Okay, but are there spaceships flying around it? I feel like that probably wouldn't be the case. That would take so much effort to do that for all the different ships. Bone, can you also um, drop the drop down again, please? Thank you. As you may have noticed, the recent list in the drop down populates as you click on locations in the list. It will remember your three most recent selections, so you can use this to quickly return to places in case you want to check something else again. Bone, let's use this to go back to Ariel. A 
Okay, so we've done a lot of exploring. I think it's time that we head back. We could do this by selecting Orison from the list, but we also have our own marker that we can take advantage of here. The eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed that the player marker clamps to the edge of the map keeping it visible to you no matter how far away you go. Again, another one of those quality of life things that they're slipping into these that make them feel like actual finished project products instead of just an alpha implementation. To get back to our position, we could double click that marker or we could click the first of the navigation buttons to zoom straight there. Now, I'm sure many of you have been wondering if we can go back to our Karak map from the star map, just like how we got here. I also really like this little detail, like a little bubble with the space station inside of it. Man, and then I think right here you can kind of see it's like a outpost of some sort. Like this is just the way they're building this game is just scratching all those sci-fi bits I've always wanted to dive into and I oh god, I love it. I love it. And it's happening. Ooh, it's happening. From the carrot map just a few minutes ago. So, Let's see what happens when we focus on our player marker. Go ahead, Ben. It's pretty nice. I like it. All right. So yeah, here's our Karak again. Being able to simply zoom between these map contexts lets you draw meaningful connections between what's on the ground and what's in the skies like never before. Bone, just for fun, let's zoom all the way back out so we can see the entire Stanton solar system. It's just so cool to watch the verse open up before our eyes. Oh God, what a nice touch. It's almost like a watch dial on the outside of the map it so scrolls around as you zoom solar system. i love it ah. it's just so cool to watch the verse open up before our eyes more color cleaner display i i don't i don't really have i think the only thing that i really don't like and i'm guessing this is something they're working on fixing so is this transition from here solar system. to there that's the only thing is like there is a definite fun. Seam Let's zoom all the way back out in the zoom so we can see the entire Stanton solar system. But once you get there and you keep zooming, you're good. It's just so cool to watch the verse open up before our eyes. This is a good system. This is a great star map, in my opinion. I don't know what makes an exceptionally good star map, but um, they are doing some great things with it. And here, I think they'll they'll talk a little bit about the future of the map and how it's going to work with planets. And then there's our interior map technology, which will truly help you understand your surroundings. Better awareness of your surroundings and threats, exploring new map and mapping new areas, pinning locations for later and sharing these with your friends. Or the Idris. That looks great. Okay, we can actually get a really good comparison of this too. If we go to Chris and Rich talking. Idris. It's a way of applying certain shaders and marking up certain objects to be displayed, like the floor gets displayed, but the walls don't. That looks great. Uh, so we can just take the existing geometry you already have streamed in that you're walking around already. Uh, and then use it to be rendered for our minimap. So this is, this is essentially in the engine using the Idris uh, ship itself and oh, the various parts of, it, of its interior to create the minimap without any special. This you know this doesn't have any specific custom like UI art for it other than some of the like level things that say you know uh, you know ground level or whatever. It's, it's one of the advantages of having high detailed yeah. ships. Yeah. Because the environment's already, you know, already in a good great. state to show straight out of the gate. And so the idea of this being systemic is that, you know, when it's in the, the feature and the is ready to go, ready for prime time and everything, it, we can just apply great. it to 
space station. Yeah, but there's a lot of traditional game development. You have to make oh, custom right. minimaps. Yeah. So you look at an environment and you go, we have to make a custom environment minimap. So you know, if we want to support lots, tens, hundreds, and thousands of locations, yeah. especially for the PU, we, and we absolutely to, for yeah. the PU, it's just it's just not viable. So we wanted to come up with a solution that we can use, you know, with minimal effort on the side of uh, content of creation, but gives Ryzen? us all of the information that we want. And this minimap is not just, uh, oh, that's where I am. It can show you objectives. It can show you other people. It can show you information about those things. And again, it's all underpinned by the radar and, and scanner. And of course, so when we call it our entirely new integration. This is just a, a, a kind of how you view your radar information in FPS. And your radar and scanner gives you so much more information than just, oh, that's the name of the door. It tells you what's the state. Does it have power? Can I hack it? You know, if it's a person, what is, what's their active status? Are they injured? So if you're coming into here and going, I'm trying to what do a medical mission, I've got a marker. Oh, it's great. Go, cool, I can get a scan of the lo local lie of the area. So his microphone's pretty messed up. But what he's kind of trying to describe is that this isn't necessarily a map that they're making. This is like they're marking up the real in-game locations. And that markup allows them to then display that location as a sort of wireframe in-game uh, map. So that's why then every ship, every thing that's in the game can be displayed like this so well. And that comes from them just building the system themselves from from scratch rather than depending on another game engine that might do maps in a certain way that might not necessarily work out the best for this. Because again, these aren't just maps for the sake of navigating. These are maps for the sake of selling. You're supposed to be able to scan a place, get more information, store it in data, and give it to someone else. And that's not something you could just plug and play from a, any game engine. That's something they had to build into the map system as they built this out. And it might be part of why it took so long. That's almost that's that's most of the UI stuff. Uh, there are there are some little things that we didn't touch on that aren't I would say are they're less things that were being worked on back in the day and more things that like were old concepts that I'm actually a bit surprised to see coming back. Uh, the main one being this sort of all this new interaction, physical interaction they've got going on. This is going to be a great touch to the game. I don't know when it's coming in. Uh, it's not really a UI thing, but it is an interaction thing. It's animation. Pretty close. The best experience. And you know, pressing buttons has never been so satisfying and fun. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, there are a lot of little little things like that that are being added in that are just raising the quality and polish of the whole thing. But that's about it. That was uh, it's not everything that's gone on in UI, but I think that was a pretty solid deep dive and look at the history of how it's developed. We skipped a couple of key points, but um, for the most part, you got to see, you know, the early days of UI and when they were just kind of throwing ideas around. Then they figured, that, okay, we need to build our own system that's going to encompass all of this. They got building blocks on the on the kind of on stage and it started working, reworking stuff, building new stuff. Slowly, they worked that into more 3D assets and they brought those online. And now we're starting to see that in things like the cargo decks or the cargo elevators. Um, the star map and other things that they haven't quite revealed to us just yet. So there's your story of Star Citizens UI. Hope you learned something a little bit new, maybe a couple new videos or something you can go watch. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming y'all.